I was preparing for my message today, I, I decided to uh, throw aside some of the things that God had laid in front of me to do this year, to uh, direction to bring the church. The way I look at the, each year is, is similar to the way I, I look at the way that Moses led the people of Israel. And I tried to find out from God, where would he want the church to be this time next year? And then I tried to come up with the messages in the the scriptures, and I pray about the things that God would like for me to share with you and to do with you in order to reach that destination. But I believe that God interrupted that because of the season that we're in, a difficult season where people in our church are going through difficult times. And I believe the Holy Spirit was moving in our worship today in a way to prepare us for this message. And now my message today, it kind of speaks for itself. Groaning the unspoken suffering. Wow. Now, put that on the billboard and try to draw a crowd. You might actually get a crowd in this world today of people that say, Amen, Pastor. Amen. It is a world of suffering. Sometimes we try to write this off as uh, something not very important because we live in the first world, they call it. Now, back when I was growing up, there was the first, second, and third world. The first world was the Western world. The second world was the communist world. And the third world were the ones that weren't aligned with either one. But nowadays, they talk about the first, second, third world as levels of economic strength. And uh, But back in my day, it was the the alignment. And today, when we talk about the first world, we think about people that are blessed beyond what they need. And in many ways, we are. In America, most of you today, most of you, not everyone, But most of you today are not struggling for shelter today. You have a place of shelter. You're not struggling to obtain the food that you will eat today and the food that you'll feed your children. You're not struggling today to come up with some way to protect yourself from evil men and women that are coming to attack you, steal from you, and kill you. You're not struggling with those things today. Those things do happen here and there, but you're not struggling with it because you live in the Western world, the, fifth, the, the first world. And so many times we write off our problems as not important because it's a first world problem. And we kind of make a joke about it. But the problem is, is that psychological pain is just as severe and debilitating, and hope-destroying as physical pain. And when you have all of this gold, metaphorically, just laying on the ground, all this opportunity, all this wealth, all of this strength, all of this, this peace that's laying around, but yet your circumstance does not match what the opportunity could be, it begins to wear upon you. In such a world as we live in, there's so many opportunities, we fail to give certain attention to some of the opportunities in favor of others. Sometimes we fail to give or to take and to... Uh, and to use the opportunity to be with our families and to spend time with our families, just talking and having some fun. And we take the opportunity of watching an unlimited number of TV shows and movies. We don't take the opportunity to get closer with our God while it the same time we take the opportunity to spend time on the internet like some are doing in our church at this very second. What we do is we take opportunities because they're so numerous, we believe that each one is equal. 
And we don't consider that every opportunity costs us something. It costs you the other opportunity. This is Economics 101. When you do one thing, you cannot be doing another one, another thing at the same time. So every opportunity you take is an opportunity that should be something that blesses you and blesses someone else around you and does not tear you down, does not destroy you, doesn't waste a second of our lives that are just breaths. Just like, like the breath on a cold, frigid morning where the steam just comes out of your breath and then it quickly fades away. That's what the Bible says our breath is like in face of eternity. And as I'm getting closer and closer to 60 years old, I can testify, yes, it feels that way. Some people say, man, I can't believe that was 10 years ago. And I'm thinking, wow, man, I still feel like it was 40 years ago. It's just like it was yesterday that I left my house and joined the military. It just seems like yesterday that my mom dropped me off at the MEP station. It seems like yesterday, and here I am. I've almost pastored this church longer than I served in the military. 18 years here, it seems like yesterday I got here. And I served almost 21 years in the military. Here I've almost been here that long. It seems like yesterday. So our lives are so quick, so why would we waste them on time-filling, non-beneficial activities? Sounds like a first world problem, but what it does is it destroys us psychologically. It destroys us socially. It destroys us spiritually. And although we've got enough food, and although we've got shelter over our heads, and although we've got some money in the bank, and although we can afford many, many more opportunities than we've ever had before in our life, although those things are happening, we are dying inside. Because we fail to take the opportunities that are important. Time with family. Time with God. Time with God's people. And time with friends. Time serving someone that you know. And time serving someone you've never met before. Things that build you up. Now I'm not saying don't have fun. I went to uh, Monster Jam yesterday. Oh, that was fun. I had a great time. And I had a great time with my wife being there as we shared that time together. It was a very important thing to do after the last few months that we've had with surgeries and deaths in the family and, and all the different things that go on during that time. We needed a break like that, that the kind of break that only a monster truck could give you. So today I want to talk about groaning, the unspoken suffering. But it's good to laugh. I'm glad that you laughed. You know, even at a funeral, we laugh. There were some pictures that came up while we were having Betty's funeral that brought tears to our eyes, deep memories, and just so pointed the loss that was there. But then there was other pictures where Betty had hair piled up to here, we laughed. Everybody laughed. Then she had those short shorts when she was younger. And uh, she a picture of the short shorts. And I'm going, that's Betty? Oh, my goodness. And we all kind of laughed at that one, too. So we're laughing and crying at the same time. And that's not escapism. That's just what life is like, isn't it? Isn't life just a jumbled group of feelings, sadness, frustration? happiness, laughter. And that's what I want this sermon to be a little bit like, too. I want it to be real. I don't want us to just have something academic shared with you. You know, I, I'm not into that. So I'm going to start with a joke. Okay, now this may or may not have happened. I don't know. But there was a farmer one day. He decided that the accident, that the traffic accident that he was in was so great that he was going to sue the, the, uh, the trucking company that ran into his car. So he took him to court. The defense brought him up there, 
and the lawyer for the trucking company began to question him, and he asked the, tr the uh, farmer this question. He said, at the accident, didn't you say that you were fine, but now you're suing for damages and for hospital bills? You said at the scene that you were fine. And the farmer began to answer the question. He said, well, that morning, I loaded up Bessie, my donkey, into the trailer and hitched it up, and we started to go down the road. Oh, whoa, whoa. I didn't ask you for all the details. I just want you to say yes or no. You said that you were fine at the accident. And the farmer took a breath, and he said, and as we were driving down the road, we came to this intersection, and the lawyer interrupted again and says, stop, stop, stop. Judge, would you instruct the witness to answer the simple question? And the judge says, well, no, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the story about Bessie and, and, and the farmer. So go ahead and tell us the story. He says, well, I had Bessie in the trailer, and I'm driving down the road, and we'd just begun our journey, and I came up to this intersection, and a big semi-truck just rammed into the side of us. I was thrown from the truck, and I landed in a ditch, and Bessie, she went tumbling down the road, and she wound up in the ditch down the road and on the other side of the road. And I heard Bessie over there just screaming, kicking, and just howling. I knew that Bessie was messed up. And it wasn't very long before a state trooper came up, and I saw him walk by, and he heard Bessie, so he went over there first, and he saw Bessie, and he looked at her, and he was hearing her screaming. So he took out his revolver, and he shot her in the head. Then he walked over to me. With his gun in his hand. And he said, I'm sorry, but I had to put your mule out of its misery. So how are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> See, the, the, the circumstances matter. The circumstances matter. And you've got to confess in your life, there's some times when you're asked how you're doing, you read the circumstances, don't you, before you say yes or no. It's not like you're lying. You just don't want to get shot in the head. <laughs> or you don't want Aunt Susie's advice. You don't want your dad's advice or your mom's advice. So you just say, fine. I'm doing fine. But inside, you're having problems that are so severe that you're not functioning right anymore. It's not working. But you're not sharing it with people because you think it might be a first world problem. And so there's groaning that is an unspoken suffering. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Well, actually, let's not turn there. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Romans 18 through 30. I'm going to stop on specific uh, scriptures in there. But in these scriptures of Romans 8, uh, 18 through 30, Paul helps us to understand how the groanings of our suffering can lead to glory. Now, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? That the groaning of our suffering can lead to glory. Now, the first idea that pops into our head is that uh, God has me suffer so I can earn glory. That's not what this says. It explains to us and gives us an understanding of how the groanings can turn into a glory. Not that the groaning or the suffering behind the groaning is what gives you glory. Because the Holy Spirit helps us when we do not know what to pray. And God is working good through all things that con to conform us to the image of His Son. Now, God doesn't send us horrible things to change us. It's just that God doesn't want you to suffer for nothing. So He enters into the midst of your suffering and He tries to turn it into something that will help you grow into the image of Christ. 
So perhaps the simplest way for us to outline this section is to note that there are three groans in this section, and we're going to touch on those a little bit. So Paul, Paul talks about the creation groaning. The creation is groaning, waiting for the return of Christ. Now why is the creation growing? Because of global warming, because of, uh, you know, the, we're polluting the earth? No, it was groaning from the beginning of the exile of Adam and Eve. The earth was cursed. Now, cursing that comes from God is different than what you might think a curse from somebody in voodoo or somebody that's a witch or something like that. Now, those are curses that are bad things that are being sent your way. By the way, if you're a Christian, they have no power. Amen? In fact, most of the power of all that is just what you believe about it is what you conjure up in your own life. They have no power over you. But that's what we think a curse is. But the curse that God sends is God taking his hand of protection away and letting what would happen, happen. And God doesn't slam his hound, hand down on you, but he simply takes his hand away and whatever happens, happens. And why would he take that hand away? Because you chose not to be under his hand. So this curse on the earth is causing all these rumblings and cracking and, and fire and smoke and, and storms and pestilence and thorns and weeds and this constant battle to grow and to survive. And the earth groans under it. Now, is it really growing, groaning? Does it have a conscience that it understands? No. It's a groaning that naturally occurs as it attempts to live and fights against the destruction. Paul also talks about the believers groaning, the sufferings that are experienced. Paul is well aware of the sufferings that a follower of Christ will suffer, the persecutions, the betrayals. In, in his case, the imprisonment for his faith, his suffering, and eventually his death. He knows all about the suffering that comes with the believer. The sharing your faith because you know that it's life and death in, the, in eternity, but yet being cast aside as a freak or someone who doesn't know what you're talking about. He knows the pain that comes from all of that. And then the third groaning, which we're going to concentrate most on today, is the groaning of the Holy Spirit. Paul began this section of Romans back in chapter 5. We're not going to go there right yet. Uh, our first scripture is going to be in Romans 8, 17. But back in chapter 5, he assures the believers of their sure hope of salvation in the face of God's judgment. In other words, when you are saved by Jesus Christ, you do not experience the judgment of God at the white throne. The wrath of God will not be poured out upon his children. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you belong to Him. That's been determined in you being a follower of Jesus Christ. Not just somebody who believes He existed, but somebody who believes in Him so much that you make the decisions of your life according to His teachings and His leading. And you are sealed. You are sure of your salvation. No enemy of God can snatch you out of His hand. No one is going to be able to overcome God and stop Him from saving you. God is saving you. You can be assured. And that's in chapter 5. You should read the book of Romans when you go home. Very slowly. Don't race through it. So Paul began this with an assurance. In chapter 8, Paul returns to, what, uh, to where he started, setting before us the wonderful fact of a solid basis for our hope as Christians. So we have a hope of salvation, but also more hope than just for salvation at the end. There's hope now. There's hope that's useful today. There's hope that gets us through this time. So now turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs. If you're a children of, child of God, then you're an heir. You're going to inherit something heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Very similar to our experience. 
Jesus Christ received a glorified body when he ascended into heaven or when he returned uh, from the grave, and we will have a body like that. So if children were heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. Not, not suffer like he suffered. Not suffer, suffer because of him, but suffer with him. See, he told us just before he left the earth, he said, go and make disciples of all creatures. Make disciples of all men. Make disciples of all women. Make disciples, teaching them what I have taught you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always. See, our suffering is not supposed to be done alone without Christ. The suffering that we will experience is with Him. He is with us. He understands our suffering. When we think about suffering with Christ Jesus, when we think about just suffering in this world, verse 18 and verse 30 of chapter 8 are very important. So verse 18 says, For I considered that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So you can almost picture that, that Paul has taken a scale and that he has taken all the sufferings of this world and his sufferings, shipwrecks, beatings, being found as if dead, and all of these sufferings, and he piles them up on one side of the scale, and the scale goes clunk. But then he takes his attention off of his suffering and turns it to the glory that waits for him as a joint heir with Christ Jesus, and he says it cannot be compared. It cannot be tested against the sufferings. It cannot even fit on the scale. The scale that can hold all of my sufferings is not large enough to be able to contain the glory which is waiting for me. It cannot be compared. I have no scale that can be so sensitive to be able to measure my sufferings, but yet so strong to measure the grandeur of the glory which is waiting for me with Christ Jesus. There, it doesn't exist. I cannot do it. And in verse 30 it says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And who he justified, these he also glorified. Now, there's a big debate about what predestined means, but I want you to look at predestination as this. Now, predestination is like football, professional football. You guys are just ready for me to make that comparison, aren't you? <laughs> you guys are awesome. Yeah, let's do it. So, professional football. Every man who plays professional football is destined to follow the rules or be penalized. They're predestined to wear the right equipment. They're predestined to play at given times and places. And they're predestined to be stinking rich. But does that mean that the little boy that grew up in southern Alabama was predestined to be a pre pro football player? No. What was predestined is what a pro football player is and what you have to do to be one and what are the blessings of being one and what are the drawbacks of being one. That's predestined. But whether or not that boy becomes a pro football player or that boy becomes a pro football player is not predestined. There are conditions that must be met. And the condition for the predestination of the church is that you become part of the church. And that church is not a denomination, it's not a building, but it's the people who follow Christ are the building blocks of the church. So when you become a part of the believers, you are predestined for glory. And you're able to get there because of what he does. He has prepared what glory will be. There's a room for everybody in his house. He's been preparing that from the foundation of the earth. 
There's a place for you. It's prepared. It's predestined. Uh, the parameters of it. And there is, he is called. He has called you. Every human being on the planet has felt the Holy Spirit testify to their heart what is good, what is evil, and that there may be a judgment in the end. And the Holy Spirit is calling you to know, to know that you need a Savior, that you can't just work your way into heaven. And every heart knows this deep down inside. And that Jesus Christ is that Savior. When you hear the words about Jesus, the Holy Spirit is calling you to believe. Everybody on the earth that hears that knows that. They don't all accept it. But when you do believe in that, and you believe in such a way that now you surrender your life to Him and His teachings, then, then you are justified. You are given full rights and privileges of a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're no longer a prisoner without rights. And then he who he justifies receives the glory we were talking about that cannot be measured. So, in between these two bookends of glory, Paul makes two basic points. Listen to these two basic points. The first point is that the future glory is the climax of God's plan for both his people and his creation. Those that are groaning will receive this glory. But since we have not reached the climax yet, we must eagerly and patiently wait. Wow. Now that's a first world problem we don't like to deal with. Waiting. For microwaves, download speed for a movie. I mean, you know how long you had to wait before? You go to Blockbuster. You want to see a a, a recent movie, and there's a little card in the slot that says that they're all out. And then you put your name on a waiting list, and then one day, months later, they call you. You've got to get in your car. You've got to wait till you get off work, and then you've you got to drive to, to, the, to the place. You've got to stand in line, get it, and, and then stand in line to pay for it. And then you've got to drive all the way home. And everybody's too tired to watch it that night, so they're going to watch it the next night. You pay overtime fees. And now we just go, click. And because a wheel spins for three seconds, we're going, man. <laughs> and we wonder why we're having a difficult time in this waiting period between now and our future glory. We can't even wait for a movie that we probably shouldn't be watching anyway. So the second point that he makes is that God provides what we need in order to wait eagerly and patiently. He doesn't leave us alone. Remember, you suffer with Christ, but you also wait with all the things that God has given you. And that's what brings us to Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it begins, Likewise, the Spirit, big S, the Holy Spirit, God, also helps in our weaknesses. It doesn't say helps you, uh, helps you because you're destitute, helps you because you've been destroyed, helps you in your weaknesses, and everybody has weaknesses. Some weaknesses that we have are very, very critical, and some weaknesses that we have we call first world problems, and we don't think they're so critical, but all of them contribute how many straws does it take to break a camel's back? Just one. The last one. And sometimes that little thing that puts you over is so small. You have all the shelter you need. You have all the food you need. You have all the security that you need. But yet you fall. Even though all these physical needs have been met, you fall because of the number of little straws. The number of little foxes, the Bible calls it. The little foxes that run around, and you get so many of them that it begins to destroy the whole crop, not just a nuisance, but it destroys your future. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. You know, we have the ability to have a deep knowledge in what we should pray for, and that's the ought. 
But we don't. God doesn't throw us out because we, we don't know how to pray like we ought to. God doesn't throw us away. He sends His Holy Spirit to pray for us, to help us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. How does He do that? He makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, this is very important, Pentecostal. These are things that can't be uttered. How come we got to utter so much? I'm not talking about a cow's utter. I'm talking about talking. The lips are always flapping. How come we can't let silence do its work and let the Holy Spirit groan? Doesn't mean we have to groan with them, but the Holy Spirit, we know because of this scripture, the Holy Spirit is groaning. Like we groaned in our suffering, like the earth groans and it's waiting for the return of Christ, groaning under the weight of of the circumstances, the Holy Spirit adopts those circumstances upon His shoulders and He makes intercession. He stands in, in the gap for us and prays for us in those moments. How does He do that? He says, Now He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Now, we're, this isn't the Spirit searching the heart, but Jesus Christ knows the heart. The one who knows the heart and knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So Jesus knows the mind of the Spirit. He knows our mind. He knows what we're going to pray even before it leaves our lips. He knows what we're going through. He's there with us in the suffering. He knows what's in our heart, but he also knows what's in the mind of the Holy Spirit, and therefore Jesus, our intermediary, the one that stands before God, the one that defends us when Satan brings accusations against us, this one, Jesus Christ, who knows what it's like to wear flesh, knows what it's like to be tempted, knows what it's like to suffer, knows what it's like to be rejected, knows what it's like to die, knows what it's like to be punished for sin, knows what it's like stands in the gap and makes intercession for us. That Jesus knows what the Holy Spirit is groaning about. He knows what you're groaning about. In verse 28 it says, And we know, I tell you what, I hope you know, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You love God, and you are called to His purpose. All these things, He has a purpose for you. Of course, He wants the purpose He has for you to be completed. So therefore, He takes all this suffering, and then He works it. He works it like clay. The clay is a lump. The clay is a, bunch, a, a block. The clay is what it is, but then He works it and makes it into something new and useful and good. Now, our problem is, is what is good? Our problem is, what is good? Too many people are stuck on the good that God's going to work out of this is all temporal and physical and, and earthly. But that's not always the good that he's working. Is that always the best? Something that's going to burn up? Something that's going to be gone? Something you can't take to heaven with you? You know, you can't take this to heaven with you. You can't take it to hell with you. You can't take it to wherever you're going. None of this stuff. So why is it that it's so good if it's not going to last? But I know what lasts and what doesn't last. But it seems like we are being, being uh, fooled into thinking that the most important things are these glitzy, lit up, fancy, exciting, new bits of plastic in our life. The entertainment, the money, the houses, the cars, they won't last, but yet we're so enamored by them. We take the opportunity to get those things and we drop the opportunity to get what lasts. To lay up treasures in heaven which cannot mold or rust or be stolen. So we're taking opportunities to gather, but we're gathering the wrong thing. So all these things work to our good. It's just that our selfish selves don't recognize what's good. 
And so we believe that God is evil, or God doesn't love me, or God doesn't take care of me. You may lose a job. And, and too many times, even though this does happen a lot, uh, too many times we think that because we lost a job, God's going to work it around to our good and give us a better job with more pay. No. That's not what this scripture means. You might, but how many good Christians are out there that have lost their jobs and didn't get a better job? Does that mean that there's something wrong with them and there's something better about you? Or what is it? How does God do that? No, what God is doing is God doesn't promise you a better job and higher pay. What God does is say, listen, the pain of losing your job, I'll turn it around to something good. Maybe I'll break your addiction to materialism. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good, God. God, make me love you in spite of having all of this material wealth. That's your job, God. It's your fault that I'm so materialistic. It's your fault that I'm this and I'm that. You should have made me different. And God all the time is saying, I can make you a new creature. All things will become new. So God does work it out for good. Now, if you've lived almost 60 years and you've been following Christ, I'm getting closer and closer to 35, 40 years of following Christ, I have seen how things that I didn't care to lose became opportunities to be blessed as a follower of Christ, as a man, a husband, a father, a friend. To become more secure. I've seen how as I've gotten older and I have my hip replacement and I have my other old age problems that the things I used to rely on, I used to be a power lifter. I would look at a weight and I'd, I'd say, I can move it. I don't care how big it is. I can move it. It might take me a couple of weeks to get ready to move it, but I'll, I'll eventually move that weight. If a human can move that weight, I can and I'll do it. And I remember the self-talk I would go through before lifting, like 800-pound deadlift. And I would, I would know the kind of talk you'd have to give because your body doesn't want to do it. And I remember how you would talk to yourself and how arrogant that speech was. And I relied on myself to move it. If God wasn't going to move it, I could move it. I can make it change. I can make it work. I can make it happen. But as I got older, I lost the ability. I don't even want to look at a weight. My back hurts when I look at them. And so I've had to rely on other people. Still today, I haven't quite gotten my flexibility back after the surgery, and so my wife has to put my shoes on for me very humbling. I can't run. I can't play basketball. I can't ride my motorcycle right now. You notice I said right now. I don't plan on doing those other things ever, but the motorcycle, I will. <laughs> so God supplies what we need to get through this time. It's not always exactly what you want in your materialistic view or your selfish view or your fleshly view, but God is working and God promises to oversee everything. He is here to provide us the help we need while we wait, and He's overseeing us and, and turning everything to our better in betterment according to His providential plan, and His plan is that we are transformed into the fullness of the stature of Christ. The stature of Christ, now. It will be completed when we're in heaven and we receive our glorified bodies. When we see him face to face, we'll know who we are because we're just like him. And that's his plan. So there are different kinds of groanings. Lots of different kinds of groanings. Typically we think of the pain of an injury as groaning. I know I did, man. I would get hurt and I'd groan. Then there's the groaning of a heartbreak. Sometimes that's the most painful, long-lasting. The groaning in bereavement, the loss of a loved one or friend. But then there's also the groanings of waiting. 
I mean, teenagers, you know what I'm talking about, right? Parents, you tell them, not now, just wait. And they go, (sighs) 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 it's like they're going to (sighs) die. It's like, it's some eating on them. It's about to, it's like alien going to burst out of their chest. It's, oh, I'm waiting. I can't have it now. So there's the groaning of waiting. Listen, adults, you do the same thing, don't you? <laughs> the, dis- the groaning of disappointments in our life. That's one of the things. To see dreams die and disappointment come. One, thing, one dream that never ends is the dream that Jesus has for you. That's always going to happen. But the dreams we had, I had dreams of being a pro baseball player, I had dreams of being this, I had dreams of being that, and nope. Nope, 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 nope. Disappointments. The, dream, the, the groanings of frustration in our life. That we can't reach a goal. We're constantly trying and we can't reach it and we're frustrated. The groanings of reaching a place of hopelessness. And that's where I see many people in our own church are about to give up. Ask yourself, am I about to give up? Am I hopeless? And there's that groan that accompanies that hopelessness and eventually the resignation to give up. Then there's the kind of groaning that we forget when we're reading this scripture. The kind of groaning that comes from doing your job to work, to actually do something. We groan under the the weight of it. Like you're lifting a weight You groan while you're lifting that weight. You know, you ever go to a gym and there's some muscle head on the other side and he's lifting some weight and he's yelling and his friends are yelling. You know what they say in the military? They say, suffer in silence. They tell that jerk over there, you're just drawing attention to yourself. I could lift that same weight with one hand and you're over there screaming like you're moving the earth. Give me a break. Suffer in silence when you're doing your weightlifting. And so that groaning of work, the groan of exercise. I normally groan when the time comes to do the exercise. And I go, oh, got to do it. The groaning of preparation. We want to do, we want to be, but it's difficult to prepare to become. And so we groan under the pressure of that. We groan in our study. We groan in the investigation that we need to undertake to become and to achieve. We groan in the process of decision making and how difficult it is when we're between two things. And we groan under taking on responsibilities. We forget about that groaning. And groaning comes in two different, or there's two kinds of people that are under the pressure of their circumstances, whether it's something tragic or something that has to do with work and becoming something. There's two kinds. There's the strong or the spiritual, and then there's the weak or the unspiritual. So groaning sound, the groaning sound that, uh, or groaning is the sound that the strong make when the full impact of circumstances are upon them. Strong people groan instead of screaming. Strong people groan instead of yelling. Strong people groan instead of cursing. Strong people groan instead of complaining. Strong people groan under the weight instead of fighting. They groan instead of punching, kicking, attacking, or punishing someone. Or that incredibly destructive practice of passive aggressiveness. Don't you hate that attack? passive aggressiveness. The strong will groan as they accept the situation and and endeavor to push through, but the weak will fight, punch, kick, and attack and push. Strong people groan as they eagerly await instead of running away from the problem. Strong people groan as they eagerly await instead of pretending the problem doesn't exist. Strong people groan as they eagerly eagerly await instead of self-medicating with alcohol, weed, drugs, whatever it is. Sometimes I think binge-watching is 
self-medication. Binge-watching TV on Netflix is like an Eastern religion. Where you sit there and you go, home, 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 home. And all of a sudden you've watched 14 seasons of God knows what, and you don't really remember it. It just happened. I, I was there, home. You're killing off time because you don't like the time you're in. The strong don't do that. The spiritually weak, the spiritually uh, immature do that. Those who do not rely on Christ and the Holy Spirit tend to give up, tear down, or destroy while they suffer. The strong in Christ or the mature in Christ groan as they endure. They protect and groan under the weight of the protecting. They groan under the, the, the work of the building up instead of tearing it apart. There's just no comparison between the sufferings that we encounter and the rewards that are waiting for us. And when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he, he told us, he, he told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse uh, 17 and 18, he said, For our light of fiction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we're judging God. That's the first way that you reject Jesus Christ, is becoming the judge of God and Christ. Judging their production. Judging their accomplishments. Judging their abilities. Judging their what they have done or not done. When we put our place, ourselves in the place of judging God, we are not a follower. We are our own God, judging another God. And so we cannot take this evidence that we see with our eyes, this evidence of whether or not material things are rising or falling, of whether or not our bodies are thriving or dying, we cannot look at those things because they're temporary. We must look at those things we do not see yet, and that is the eventual glory that we will obtain if we patiently wait for our reward. In the meantime, we groan under the weight of the burdens and the labor and against the curse on the earth. We labor to, to work, we labor to serve God, and we labor to serve humankind. And many times we groan in that. I have an, uh, a work I'm going to do this, uh, this afternoon uh, where I'm going to visit somebody and, and my, my, my whole soul is groaning in anticipation of visiting them. Not because I don't want to see them, but because of what they're going through. I'm joining with them. I'm walking with them and it, it's something that no one wants to do, but I'll do it. And I groan under that burden. We groan in the waves of sorrow and loss. We groan in the throbs of physical and emotional pain. We groan as we study, prepare our future lives on this earth and for our future in heaven. And we groan in the midst of our search for an intimate relationship with God. The one who saved us, the one who stole our hearts. And we strive, we struggle, and sometimes we groan because it seems like we take two steps forward and three back sometimes in our walk with Christ. And if the praise and worship team could come, you could put up the last slide. Groaning, the work of the Holy Spirit. We do not groan under this weight alone. The Holy Spirit himself groans with us. He takes our sorrows, he takes our pain, he takes our depression, and he carries them to God. He presents them before the throne of God and then God takes them up in his hands, this chaotic mess of pain and sorrow and hurt and he begins to mold it but we must be patient for the process to be completed. He doesn't just zap it in the microwave but he forms it with his hands in a short period of time called your life. 
And for all eternity, what he makes will last. He will finish the good work that he has begun in you.